In this lecture, I will discuss forces and Newton's laws of motion. In the previous chapters, I discussed the kinematic nature of motion in terms of displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Now we are going to turn towards the dynamics of the moving uh, objects and more specifically how objects move, what makes them move the way they do, and that is through the concept of force. So a force in general is a push or a pull, and forces act in two different manners, through contact, so those are contact forces, such as friction, elastic force, normal force, and tension in ropes, and then we have forces that act from a distance. So those are forces that do not require contact to present themselves. And examples of such forces are gravitational force, electrical forces, magnetic force, and so on. Forces are vector quantities. And therefore, as we already know, a force would be graphically depicted by a straight line ending with an arrow which indicates the direction, and then the magnitude of the force is listed as well. So we have two different forces here, a 15 Newton force and a five Newton force. The length of the arrow uh, or of the line is the magnitude of the force. The arrow, one more time, indicates direction. So since forces are vector quantities, we are going to treat them exactly the same way we did velocity and acceleration in terms of calculations. So a force um, directed randomly in space will be placed in a coordinate system. It will be broken into vector components. And from there, the scalar components can be found. And then addition can be performed between different forces. A resultant force is found. From there, we can find magnitude the orientation in space, and so on and so forth. An important quantity related to the way forces affect the motion of objects is mass. Mass is a measure of the amount of stuff or material or substance that is contained in the volume of an object. And mass is a constant quantity. Mass does not change unless the object is broken into pieces or more material is added to the object. So mass is constant and it never changes. The mass of an object never changes. The symbol that is used for mass in physics is M. This is not to be confused with the units of meters for in different quantities. So when we are dealing with units, M means meters. When we are dealing with formulas, M means mass. Now let's state Newton's first law of motion. Isaac Newton was a brilliant physicist in the 17th century, and he formulated several um, fundamental laws explaining and describing how force acts in nature. So Newton's first law reads that an object continues in a state of rest or in a state of motion at constant speed along a straight line, unless compelled to change that state by a net force, where the net force is the vector sum of all of the forces acting on an object. Let's discuss the meaning of the first law. Let's first look at the first part of the statement. An object continues in a state of rest unless compelled to change that state by a net force. So what does that mean? Well, let's take, for example, a simple wooden block that is resting on a flat horizontal surface. So right now, this wooden block is at rest. And so if it's left on its own, without any outside influence, one would expect that this block will remain at rest forever. There is no reason for this block to move in any direction whatsoever. The only possibility for this block to move is if an external, or in other words, net force, is 
applied to the block. So either somebody pulls on the block with some string or pushes on the block or lifts the block vertically up, doesn't matter. But the only option for the block to move is to force to be applied to it. So one more time, the block will only move if a net force F is applied on it. The second part of the statement of the first law is more interesting to discuss. So the second part states that an object continues in a state of motion at a constant speed along a straight line unless compelled to change that state by a net force. So let's consider another wooden block that is sliding across a flat horizontal surface and there is no friction between this block and the surface. So let's imagine that this block possesses velocity V and this velocity will remain the same, meaning maintains the same direction and magnitude forever unless a force is applied to the block to make it either accelerate or slow down or change direction of motion. All these three possibilities result in change of velocity. So, left on its own, this block will be sliding across this flat horizontal frictionless surface forever. And the only way the velocity will change is if force is applied to the block to either make it speed up, slow down, or make a turn. So here is a sketch of the possibilities. When the block is moving to the left, if force F is applied on the block in the same direction as the direction of motion, then the velocity of the block will increase. By magnitude, the direction remains the same. So now that's a different velocity compared to the initial state of motion of the block. It's also possible that force acts on the block in the direction opposite to the direction of motion, in which case the velocity of the block will decrease. And finally, it's possible that as the block is moving along a straight line, a force F starts to act on the block in such a way as shown in the drawing, in which case that's going to make the block start to turn as it goes, and then the direction of the velocity will change along the trajectory of motion. The magnitude may change or may remain the same. In either case, the velocity changes constantly. So that means that if an object is moving with constant velocity, one could conclude that there is no net force acting on the object. And then if an object is either accelerating or decelerating, so the velocity changes, or the object is changing direction as it's moving, that means that a net force must be acting on this object. Finally, in addition to the first law statement, there is a definition of what a net force is. And the net force is defined as the vector sum of all of the forces that are acting on an object. So let's see what that. So here we have an example of a block which is under the action of two separate forces. We have a 10 Newton force to the right and a 4 Newton force to the left. So by the rules of adding vectors, and this is a one-dimensional addition here. The resultant vector of adding the 4 and 10 Newton vectors like so would be a 6 Newton vector to the left. And so that, will, that is the net force. So basically the block under the action of the 10 and 4 Newton forces acts in the same way as if it was under the action of only one 6 Newton force acting in that direction. And now is the place to say that the units for force in the metric system are newtons. And <clears throat> all forces, no matter of the type of force, 
are always measured in newtons. So the force of friction, gravitational force, electric force, tension force, normal force, the weight, all of those are measured in newtons in the metric system. Here is a different example of finding the net force. So again, we have a block under the action of a 4 newton force to the left and 3 newton force up. So the resultant force would be found by doing a standard addition by components. And you would find when you do that, that the net force is this vector, which if you do the math, we'll find out is equal to five newtons, and it is directed at 64 degrees from the horizontal. So the block under the action of the four newton force and the three newton force behaves in the exact same way as if it was under the action of a single five newton force described by this, um, by this angle from the horizontal. So what does that tell us? It tells us that if we have an object under the action of multiple forces, we can first find the net force that acts on this object, so as the vector sum of those individual forces, and then start solving for the, um, using Newton's laws to determine how the object will be moving based on that net force. This method makes the calculations easier because otherwise you would have to use Newton's laws for each individual force separately and then add the results together. And that might be more cumbersome and easier to, you know, introduce mistakes in your calculations as opposed to working with the net force directly. A quantity that is um, related to um, the quote-unquote willingness of objects to change the state of their motion is the inertia. So the inertia is the natural tendency of an object to remain at rest or in motion at a constant velocity along a straight line. So what does that mean? Well, it means that if you have a, a block that's resting on a flat surface, this block doesn't want to move on its own. The only way it will move is if a, a net force is applied to it. And then if the block is in motion already, it will want to move on a straight line with constant speed and it doesn't want to change direction or slow down or speed up. The only way uh, that can happen is if a net force is applied on that object. And so all of that is because of inertia. So let me give you a few real time examples or real life examples for uh, manifestation of inertia. So imagine that you are pushing an empty shopping cart in the store and you obviously know that it's very easy to push the cart forward, to stop it, to pull it backwards, to make turns with it. Extremely easy. Now imagine you load it with some heavy objects, let's say a bunch of uh, gallon um, water bottles, all full with water. Now imagine what happens. It's, it's going to be hard to make the cart move if it was initially at rest. It's going to be hard if the car, uh, cart was moving to make it stop. And it is also hard to make the car, uh, the cart make a turn. All of this is because the inertia of the cart is much higher compared to uh, or much bigger compared to when the, uh, the cart was empty. The problem with inertia is that this is not a quantitative property of objects. We cannot measure uh, inertia, but inertia is related to the mass of an object. So the mass of an object is a quantitative measure of inertia. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that heavy objects have large inertia and light objects have small inertia. So that means that an empty cart has, which has small mass, has small inertia, and it's very easy to make it move, slow it down, take a turn. And a loaded cart has large mass, which means it has large inertia, which then makes it harder to push it to move, slow it down, make a turn with it.
Another example of um, manifestation of inertia is a person in the in the passenger seat in a moving car that is taking a turn at higher speeds. And you probably have all experienced that as the car starts to take a turn, your body leans towards the door. Why is that? It's because as the car is turning you know, or entering the turn, your body has inertia and according to the first law, it doesn't want to change the way it's moving, meaning on a straight line. So as the car is starting to turn, your body is still kind of moving on a straight line and therefore leaning into the door. And only because the door is there, <clears throat> you actually are taking the, the turn along with the car. If there was no door <clears throat> to keep you in place, then you would fall off the car. The units for mass in the metric system are kilograms. In this course, we are only going to deal with reference frames, meaning coordinate systems that do not accelerate. They are either at rest or they are moving with constant velocity. So such reference frames are termed inertial reference frames. And accelerating reference frames are non-inertial. An example of a non-inertial reference frame would be a turning car, meaning going on the road and taking a turn, that is a accelerating reference frame. And so when you sit in that car and it's taking your, the turn, you feel as if you are uh, being pushed out of the car and you would think that there is a force that acts on you, but that is not correct. This is an imaginary force that is a result of the fact that the car is accelerating as it's taking the turn. And so because of the inertia of your body, you feel as if a force is pushing you out of the car, but that's not the case. It's just the inertia of your body wants to continue going on a straight line. If you would consider a reference frame that is not moving with acceleration, but it's moving with constant velocity, for example, a bus that is going at 30 miles per hour on a straight line and it doesn't change that speed or direction, inside you are never going to feel a force that is pushing you in any direction. So that's an example of inertial reference frame. So again, for our purposes in this course, we are dealing with inertial reference frames and typically that would be the Earth since we are looking at situations that, hap that are happening on Earth. So for us, that is an inertial reference frame without acceleration. So I explained that the net force that acts on an object is the sum of all forces that act on this object. And so mathematically, the net force is written as this sum, the sum of all forces. So this can be written as the sum of the force force number one, plus force number two, plus force number three, plus however many forces there are that act on the object. So you add all of these forces together as vectors, and that is the net force also as a vector. Another notation that is used is just that the net force is equal to that sum. Now I'm ready to state Newton's second law. Newton's second law states that when a net external force, force acts on an object of mass m, the acceleration that results is directly proportional to the net force and has a magnitude that is inversely proportional to the mass. Also, the direction of the acceleration is the same as the direction of the net force. So let's break this down. So the statement says that when a net external force acts on an object with mass m, this object will be moving with acceleration a, which is proportional to the force. But it's inversely proportional to the mass. What does that mean? It means that if the mass is kept constant, but the force is increased, then the acceleration will also increase. 
But if the force is kept constant and the mass changes, if the mass increases, the acceleration will decrease, or if the mass decreases, the acceleration will increase. And so this is Newton's second law, and it's extremely important because this is what we use to solve a lot of problems involving the dynamics of motion of objects. One extremely important point, which is stated in the second law, is that the direction of the acceleration is the same as the direction of the net force. Which means that if you have an object in motion and you know the direction of the net force, then you also know the direction of the acceleration with which this object is moving, and vice versa. If you know the direction of the acceleration of motion of an object, you also know the direction of the force that's acting on this object. Now let's look into more detail uh, of the units of force. So we know that from the second uh, law, the force is equal to mass times acceleration. And we also know that the units for force are newtons. Okay, but on the right-hand side of this formula, we have mass and acceleration multiplied together. And the units for mass we know are kilograms. And the units for acceleration are meters per second squared. So the two multiplied will give me the unit will give me what a newton is in terms of base units and so a newton is equal to one kilogram times one meter per second squared so that is what a newton is equal to which means that when you're doing calculations you always must make sure that the mass is in kilograms and typically the acceleration is in meters per second squared but if it's not you must convert the acceleration units to meters per second squared. Only then the answer of the calculation of mass times acceleration will be equal to force in the correct units, which are newtons. If you do not do these conversions here and you keep the units uh, different than what these are here, then your answer will be wrong because it's not going to be in newtons. And so here in this table for comparison, um, they provide the units for mass, acceleration, and force in different measurement systems. In the metric system, the mass is measured in kilograms, acceleration is in meters per second squared, and the force is measured in newtons. In the old centimeter gram seconds uh, system, the mass is measured in grams, the acceleration in centimeters per second squared, and the force in dynes. So again, we are not using that system here at all. And then in the imperial system, the mass is measured in slugs, the acceleration is feet per second squared, and force is measured in pounds. Because in the United States, when we talk about heavy objects, or the heaviness of an object, we use pounds, we are talking about force. And this is more specifically the gravitational force with which the, gra the Earth pulls on the mass of this object. Everywhere else in the world where the metric system is used, when we talk about heavy objects, we talk about the mass of these objects. And so, for example, if you go to Europe and you're buying some you know, food items at the store, the, you're paying by mass, so per kilogram. And here in the USA, we're paying by force per pound. So that's a big difference and causes a lot of confusion for students. Because mass and force are not the same thing. So you got to be careful when you do problems in this course. And the problems are with metric units. We are talking about a quantity that never changes. Mass is constant. To solve problems involving forces acting on an object, a method known as free body diagram is used. A free body diagram is a diagram that represents the object and the forces that act on it. And so here is a simple example. We have a car that's being pushed by two people 
they apply forces of 275 newtons and 395 newtons to the right. And then there is a opposing force, which uh, you would guess is friction, and that would be a correct guess, of 560 newtons to the left. So if I want to sketch the forces that act on this body, which is the car, uh, it's obviously not practical to try and draw a car and then two uh, figures pushing on the car and all that. Instead, it is very common to indicate the car with a dot or a point object and place it at the origin of a coordinate system, y and x, and then indicate the forces that act on this object with their directions and their magnitudes. Another uh, possibility of notation, and that is the one that I actually prefer, is to have my object that is the car, and then I have my two forces F1 of 275 Newtons and then F2 of 395 to the left and then the opposing force F3 which is 560 Newtons like so and then I also add my coordinate system like this So both are identical, this is just how I'm used to do it, and so when I show example solution, example problems, that's how I'm going to be doing it. Nevertheless, this schematic representation is much easier to follow and understand and draw all the forces that are present compared to an actual drawing of what is going on, or the problem. So now let's do this example actually. So um, this car is under the action of three forces, two forces that acts, that push the car in positive x direction and of an opposing force that is directed in negative x direction. So then following the definition of a net force, which was that the net force, which it was equal to the sum of all forces acting on the car. So that will be uh, F1 plus F2 plus F3, where F1 is 275 Newtons, F2 is 395 Newtons, and F3 is equal to 560 Newtons. And so to calculate the net force, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to add these forces by magnitude but I'm also going to account for direction so force F1 is in point positive x direction so the magnitude comes in this sum here with positive sign 275 newtons force F2 which is 395 newtons also points in positive x direction so that comes into the calculation with a positive sign as well so plus 395, but force F3 points in negative x direction. So in the sum here, it comes with a minus sign. So we have minus 560 newtons. And so when you add all of these three together, you get positive 110 newtons, which means that the net force is directed in positive x direction. And it has magnitude of 110 newtons. So again, as with the previous chapters, it is important to pay attention to the directions of the vectors. And when you're doing the calculations using their components, you have to include proper signs in order to get the answer correct. And then when you get your answer, you will read the sign in front of the value. And that sign will tell you how the net force is oriented or directed. So now that I know the net force that acts on the car, I can also calculate the acceleration of the car if I know the mass. So if the mass of the car is 1850 kilograms, then from the second law, I can calculate the acceleration as the ratio of the net force to the mass of the car. 
So that is 110 newtons divided by 1850 kilograms, or this is plus 0 0.059 meters per second squared. So again, this sign here confirms what the second law stated, and that was that the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. So the net force is directed in positive x direction, the acceleration is directed in positive x direction. So the general definition of Newton's second law is simply a vector equation that says that the net force vector is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration vector with which the object is moving. But um, if the motion is in two-dimensional space, then that means that I can break down this vector equation into two equations by components along each coordinate direction. So I have a net force in x direction is equal to mass times acceleration in x direction. And then I also have that the net force component in y direction is equal to the mass of the object times the y component of the acceleration. So what does that mean graphically? So here is my coordinate system and I'm going to place an object at the origin. And so this object will have some mass m and it's under the action of a net force f. But we know from before that this force f can be presented as the sum of two forces, one along the x direction and one along the y direction. So then that means that I can write Fy is the sum of May. So this object will have a acceleration component in the y direction. And I also can write that Fx is equal to Max. So this object has a component of the acceleration in x direction as well. And so I can then also present these in component form as shown right here. And I can do calculations with that because this is just the magnitude or the component of the y, of the y component of the uh, net force. This is the magnitude of the y acceleration. This is the magnitude of the x component of the force. And this is the magnitude of the x acceleration. And so this breakdown here is extremely important to be able to solve problems <clears throat> involving forces. So let's look at the following example. A raft is in the water and a person is paddling, producing a force P of 17 newtons due east. So that is this force right here in positive x direction. <clears throat> a wind has come and it's blowing with force of 15 newtons at 67 degrees with respect to east. So that force is shown in the diagram right here. 15 newtons due to the wind 67 degrees from the positive x direction. If the raft has a mass of 1300 kilograms, what are the x and y components of the raft's acceleration? So before um, I start explaining the problem, I must present the force due to the wind as the sum of two vectors, one along the x direction and one along the y direction. So the x component is a cosine of 67 degrees and the y component is a sine of 67 degrees. So that means that in x direction on the raft there are two forces that are acting and that is the force P and the force a cosine of 67. And in y direction, there is only one force acting, and that is A sine of 67 degrees. So now that I have the breakdown into forces like that, I can use Newton's second law to find the acceleration along the x direction, the acceleration along the y direction. 
So I can make a table with the components or the ingredients that I know. So I know the force P, which has an X component of 17 newtons and Y component of zero newtons because that force acts only in positive X direction. And then I have the force A acting on the raft with the next component of A cosine of 67, so that is 15 times cosine of 67. And the Y component, which was A sine of 67, or in other words, 15 newtons times sine of 67 degrees. And so when you add the two X components, that gives us a net force with X component of 23 newtons and the Y component of 14 newtons. So the net force has an X component, which is 23 newtons, and a Y component, which is 14 newtons. So now I can use Newton's second law by components, just like I showed you here. to find the acceleration component. So the X component of the acceleration is equal to the X component of the net force divided by the mass of the raft. So that's 23 Newtons divided by 1300 kilograms. That is positive 0 0.018 meters per second squared. The Y component of the acceleration is equal to the net force in Y direction divided by the mass of the raft. So that is 14 Newtons divided by divided by 1300 kilograms, that's positive 0 0.011 meters per second squared. Here I want to show you how I get the units of meters per second squared when I divide Newtons by kilograms. So Newtons divided by kilograms gives me kilograms meter per second squared, which is what the Newton is. Divide that by a kilogram, and so the kilogram units cancel out, and I get meters per second squared. So that means that if you're dividing Newtons by kilograms, the answer automatically is meters per second squared. It's the units for acceleration in the correct units. And finally, let's state Newton's third law of motion. This is the law of action and reaction, as you may have heard it being um, titled. So action, reaction. Whenever one body exerts a force, and that is the action, on a second body, the second body exerts an oppositely directed force of equal magnitude on the first body, and that is the reaction force. And you see multiple examples of action-reaction forces in, uh, around you. For example, a calculator resting on the surface of a bench is an example of the application of, a, of the third law. The calculator pushes down on the surface of the bench with its weight. As a result, the bench pushes back up on the calculator with what we know as the normal force, which we will discuss a little bit later. And so the two forces are equal in size, opposite in direction. They produce zero net force. Therefore, the calculator is at rest. No net force act on it. The calculator is not moving. It has no reason to. Similarly, for an object that is moving with constant velocity, meaning that net force is zero, this object might be under the action of multiple forces, but they all cancel each other. So action-reaction pairs form, and as a result, there is no acceleration, even though the object is moving. Another very important action-reaction pair of forces is the gravitational force between the Earth and the Moon. So both planets pull on each other with the same force, but directed in opposite directions. And so that is an example of action-reaction pairs. And there is many, many more in uh, the world around us. Let's look at this example problem that illustrates Newton's third law. So we have a spacecraft and we have an astronaut. And so they are initially at rest in space, but then the astronaut pushes on the spacecraft. And so as a result, a force plus P is applied on the spacecraft and the spacecraft moves to the left. But because of Newton's third law, the same exact force, but in opposite direction, minus P, is applied on the astronaut, and they are moving to the left. So, suppose that the magnitude of this force P is 36 Newton, 
uh, newtons and if the mass of the spacecraft is spacecraft is 11000 kilograms and the mass of the astronaut is 92 kilograms what are the accelerations of each so the net force that acts on the spacecraft is just the force p and the net force that acts on the astronaut is minus p so the acceleration of the spacecraft is equal to the net force divided by the mass of the spacecraft. So that is 36 newtons divided by 11,000 kilograms. That is plus 0 0.0033 meters per second squared. For the astronaut, the net force divided by the mass is equal to minus 36 newtons divided by 92 kilograms. And that is negative 0.39 meters per second squared. Notice the same force is applied by magnitude, of course, on both objects, the spacecraft and the astronaut. But because of the difference in mass, the astronaut has much larger acceleration compared to the spacecraft. This is a um, result of Newton's second law, where I said that the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass. The larger the mass, the smaller the acceleration when the force is kept constant. And the smaller the mass, the larger the acceleration when the force is kept constant. Newton did not stop with only formulating the three laws of motion. He also formulated the law of universal gravitation. The law of universal gravitation states that every particle in the universe exerts an attractive force on every other particle. A particle is a piece of matter small enough in size to be regarded as a mathematical point. And the force that each exerts on the other is directed along the line joining the particles. And so if I were to sketch this situation, I have my two particles with mass m1 and m2. Both are a distance r from each other. And they act on each other with the same gravitational force by magnitude f but in opposite directions and this is attractive force so to calculate the magnitude of the gravitational force you would use this formula the gravitational force f is equal to this constant g which is known as the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the first particle times the mass of the second particle particle divided by the distance between the two particles to the second power. So one more time, g is the, has the value of 6.673 times 10 to the negative 11th newton meter square per kilogram square is known as the universal gravitational constant. And it's universal because it has that same value anywhere in the universe. It doesn't change no matter what. Notice that the force, the gravitational force between two object de objects depends inversely to the square of the distance between the two objects. Which means that when the objects move far away from each other, this force decreases as the square of the distance. And if the objects are moving closer to each other, the force will increase um, as the square of the distance. So that means that if two objects are a fixed distance from each other and then the distance is doubled, the force will um, be four times smaller. Or if the two objects are a certain distance from each other and then the distance is cut in half, that will increase the force between the two four times. So if I take my two objects to be of mass 12 kilograms and 25 kilograms, place the distance of 1.2 meters from each other, I can calculate the gravitational force between the two by multiplying the gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th newton meter square per kilogram square, by 12 kilograms, by 25 kilograms, and dividing by 1.2 meters squared, and that gives me 1.4 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons. As you can see here, these objects are pretty heavy. 12 kilograms, that's about 24 pounds, and this here is about 20, uh, 50 pounds. This distance is roughly 4 feet, and the force of interaction is only 10 to the negative 8 newtons. This is a very weak force. However, every particle in the universe attracts every other particle in the universe. No matter how small this force is, and that's, they, those will be mind-blowingly small, but they are still there. They do not become zeros.
That means that if you leave the universe on its own and let's say it's not expanding and just freeze it in space and then let it collapse. And let's say you have only one small tiny microscopic particle that's attracting everything else. Eventually, everything is going to get attracted to it and it's going to form, you know, a nucleus. Extremely dense nucleus. So that's how powerful gravitation is. Let's look at several different um, specific forces. Uh, we will start with the force of weight. The weight of an object on or above the Earth is the gravitational force that the Earth exerts on the object. The weight always acts downwards towards the center of the Earth. And on or above another astronomical body, <clears throat> the weight is the gravitational force exerted on the object by that body. The weight is measured in Newtons since it is just another force. And in the metric system, the Newtons are the units for force. When I discussed mass, I said that mass is a quantity that doesn't change because it is related to the amount of uh, substance or material in the volume of a body. But the weight is a force, and that can change with time, uh, depending on which, um, let's say, planet or star or celestial object we are on. For example, the weight of a 100 kilogram person on Earth and on the Moon is completely different due to the fact that the gravitational acceleration is different on those two planets. So consider a small object with mass m above the surface of the Earth. This object will experience a force due to gravity of Earth, which is the weight of the object. And so essentially that is a gravitational force. Therefore, I can write the expression for the weight using the definition of force of gravity as W is equal to G times mass of the Earth times mass of the object divided by the distance from the center of the Earth to the second power. In other words, I can also write the weight as the product of the mass of the object and the gravitational acceleration. And so then it turns out when I compare the two versions of the formula for weight, that the gravitational acceleration is the product of the gravitational constant, the mass of the Earth, and divided by the distance from the center squared. So, of course, this formula can be used to calculate the gravitational acceleration of any celestial object by replacing the mass of Earth here with the mass of that object, and then the distance to the center of the Earth with the distance to the center of that object. And so, as I was saying, the gravitational acceleration on Earth is much bigger than that on the Moon because the mass of the Earth is bigger than the mass of the Moon and the radius of Earth, of course, is also different. So, the force of weight due to that fact can change depending on where it is measured, depending on the value of the gravitational acceleration. Another uh, specific force that I want to discuss is the normal force. I already stated a few examples where we had an object laying on a flat surface. And um, this object is, let's say, stationary. And it might appear that the object is not a subject of any forces that act on it, but that is not the case. Now let's consider this cinder block that's resting on the surface of a table. So we know that Earth will cause a force of weight to uh, appear. And so the force of weight is the force with which this cinder block is going to act on the surface of the table or on the table. Okay, so Newton's third law says that for any force with which an object acts on another object, this other object will act on the first object with a different force um, in opposite direction, the same magnitude. And so um, 
the force with which the table pushes back on the cinder block is the normal force. The two forces are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. So the force of weight is equal to minus the normal force. And the normal force by magnitude is equal to the force of weight. And so as you can see from the first um, formula, if I move both on the same side, I get that the net force is equal to zero. And as we know, when we place an object on a flat horizontal surface, this object will remain at rest. It's not going to move on its own. And so that's what this is about. For any object that is in contact with a surface, whether that is at an angle or horizontal, there is always a normal force present. We are going to see various examples of configurations of an object and a surface on which that object is um, in contact with, and then we will discuss how the normal force appears and what the direction is. Now let's look at two specific cases. So we have our block resting on a flat horizontal surface. The weight of this block is 15 newtons. And so therefore, if the block was left on its own, the normal force would be 15 newtons in opposite direction. However, if additional force of 11 newtons is applied vertically down on the block, effectively, the weight can be considered to be 26 newtons. And so as a result, the surface will exert a normal force on the block of 26 newtons. The normal force can be reduced by applying a vertical force up to reduce effectively the weight of the block. So if the block weights 15 newtons, but 11 newton force is applied vertically up by pulling on the rope here, the effective normal force that the, the surface will apply on the block is only 4 newtons, 15 minus 11. And so this leads us to an interesting phenomenon, which is known as apparent weight. So this is the weight that the person will measure by stepping on scales inside an elevator when the elevator is moving. So first, if the elevator is stationary, a person that has a weight of 700 newtons will read on the scale 700 newtons. But if the elevator is moving up, what the person will read on the scales will be more than their weight. And let's say that's a thousand newtons. And so those of you that have been in, in an elevator that moves fast, when the elevator moves fast up, you get the feeling as if you are heavy or heavier than your normal weight. That is because if you stepped on scales, you would read your weight as more than your actual weight. So here, 700 newtons became 1,000 newtons. Now, if the elevator is going down with some acceleration, <clears throat> the person will read on the scales weight that is less than their actual weight. And the feeling for those of you that have been in an elevator like that is that you feel light. And so that is why. And so for an elevator, for which the cable breaks and the elevator is in free fall, the person inside will, free, will feel as if they're weightless. The scales will read zero. So to explain this phenomenon, let's look at the forces that act on the person. So the person uh, and the scale. So the person pushes down on the scales with the force of weight. And as a result, the scales push back up with the normal force. So then, if the elevator is moving, I can write Newton's second law for the y-coordinate direction as the net force in y direction is equal to the normal force minus the weight of the person. And that will be equal to mass times acceleration of the uh, uh, person. 
So from here, then I can solve for the normal force. And the normal force will be equal to the weight plus minus times acceleration due to the motion of the elevator. So this part here is the true weight. And then when we add the extra force due to the acceleration of the elevator, that will be the apparent weight. So when the elevator is moving up, this acceleration value is positive, and therefore this sum is larger than mg, and therefore the apparent weight is bigger than the true weight. When the motion is straight down, then the acceleration here has a negative value, and therefore the sum of the two terms here is less than the weight of the person, so the apparent weight then is less than the true weight. A very important force that we will talk about is the force of friction. This is a force that is present in all aspects of life. And so now let's talk what friction is. So to cause friction to occur, you must bring two surfaces into contact. And then you also must make them move with respect to each other. Once these two surfaces start to move with respect to each, other, to each other, a frictional force arises, and this frictional force is parallel to the interface between the two surfaces. And this frictional force is directed in direction opposite to the direction of motion of the top object. So typically when we discuss friction, we have in mind such an object such as a block or a crate or something like that, sliding across surface, across some surface. So the force of friction will be parallel to the interface between that object and the surface, and the force of friction will be directed in direction opposite to the direction of motion of that object. By the nature of the friction force, there are two types of friction forces. We have static friction and we have kinetic friction. Let's first talk about the static friction force. Static friction force appears when we have two surfaces that are not sliding across one another, but a force is applied to make the top surface move. So here's an example. We have a flat horizontal surface and we have a block of wood on, uh, resting on that surface. And then force F is applied to the left, but the block is not moving. This force is just not enough to move the block. So why is the block not moving? Well, because a force of static friction arises between the block and the flat surface here. And this force of static friction is equal to the applied force. Therefore, the net force on the block is zero. The block is not moving. If the force that's applied increases, so will the static friction force. So the net force is still zero. And so if the, net, if the force applied is increased even more, eventually it will reach a point that will be, at which this force F will be, is equal to the maximum static friction force possible between those two surfaces after which the block will start to move. So, if no force is at all applied to the block, there is no friction force between the block and the surface. But once a force is applied to try and move the block, a static friction force arises, the block is not moving. The pulling force increases, the static friction force increases. The pulling force increases until it reaches a value which is equal to the maximum static friction force value. Once the pulling force is more than the maximum static friction force value, the block will start to move across the surface, and we are no longer talking about static friction. And so, the magnitude of the static friction force can be from zero to that maximum static friction force value. The maximum static friction force value is calculated as the product of the coefficient of static friction, mu sub s, and the normal force with which the um, surface pushes on the block. 
the coefficient of static friction is always a number bigger than zero but less than one so less than one and it has no units because if I were to calculate the coefficient of friction from this formula, I will be dividing force measured in newtons by force measured in newtons, so this coefficient is just a number. But remember, the coefficient of static friction is less than 1, but more than 0. So once the block starts to move under the action of this pulling force, now a different force of friction is... Um, in action, and that is the force of kinetic friction. The force of kinetic friction is calculated as the product of the coefficient of kinetic friction and the normal force. The coefficient of kinetic friction is larger than zero, but it's less than one. As a matter of fact, the coefficient of kinetic friction is actually smaller than the coefficient of static friction, and therefore that's why for the same object with the same weight, and therefore, the same normal force acting on it, the force of static friction is larger than the force of kinetic friction. And for example, an application to this um, fact is the um, ABS systems in the brakes of cars. When the system is engaged for a fraction of time, the tires actually are not rotating, which causes for a fraction of time a static friction force to appear between the tires and the road and since the static friction force is larger than the kinetic friction force the car would stop a little bit faster or sooner compared to if kinetic friction was involved if the car was just sliding on the road from experiment it turns out that the magnitude of the frictional force does not depend on the contact area of the two surfaces so if I have the same block made from the same material and I flip it on all of its three uh, different sides, I will find and measure the friction force, I will find out that the friction force is the same. So experimentally this has been shown. So the surface area of contact is irrelevant for the force of friction. What matters is the mass of the object and the materials from which the object and the surface are made. Now let's look at one example. So a sled and its rider are moving horizontally with velocity of 4 meters per second. And due to force of friction with the ice surface uh, or the snow surface under the sled, after some time, the sled stops moving. Let's calculate the force of friction between the sled and the snow. So since there is uh, the object is moving, the force of friction is kinetic friction, and the kinetic friction is calculated as the product of the coefficient of kinetic friction and the normal force. The problem is that we don't know what the normal force is equal to explicitly, but we know from the equilibrium of forces in vertical direction that the normal force is balanced by the weight of the sled and the person in it. So therefore, I can replace the normal force with the weight of the person in the sled and the force of kinetic friction becomes the product of the coefficient of friction and the weight. Now I know all the information necessary to calculate the problem. Um, I know that the coefficient of kinetic friction is 0 0.05 and I know that the mass of the sled plus the person is 40 kilograms. So we have 0 0.05 times 40 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared is equal to 20 newtons. So this is the force of kinetic friction. I can also find the distance x that it took the sled to stop moving. So in order to do that, I need to use Newton's second law to figure out what's the acceleration of the sled. The second law says that mass times acceleration in x direction will be equal to the net force in x direction. So there is only one force that acts on this sled in x direction, and that is the, uh, the force of kinetic friction. So therefore, mass times acceleration must be equal to minus fk. The minus sign here appears because the sled is moving in positive x direction, but the force of friction is 
acting in opposite direction, so therefore the minus sign. So from here, I can calculate the acceleration. And the acceleration is uh, negative 0.5 meters per second squared. The minus sign here simply indicates that the acceleration is in direct direction opposite to the direction of motion, pointing in negative x direction. And if you remember from the statement of the second law, you would expect that the acceleration is in the same direction as the net force. So the net force here, again, is the force of kinetic friction, which points in negative x direction. And hence, the acceleration also points in negative x direction. To find the displacement or the distance that the sled traveled until stop, I'm going to use this kinematic equation. Vx squared is equal to V0x squared plus 2 times Ax times x. So rearranging for to find an expression for x and substituting the values in that expression, I get that the distance traveled by the sled to full stop is uh, was 16 meters. So this problem is an example how both kinematics and dynamics are used to solve the problem. So the first part of the problem was solved using Newton's second law and the second part of the problem was solved using a combination of Newton's second law and kinematic equations. So you will encounter quite a few problems where both concepts, the concepts from kinematics and dynamics, are used to solve a problem. Another common force that's encounter, encountered through various physics problems is the tension force. The tension force arises in a rope when it's pulled tight. So, for example, we have a block that's uh, connected to a rope and somebody is pulling on the free end of the rope. So the force with which that person is pulling on the free end of the rope is transmitted through the rope and becomes the tension force in the rope. So the tension force in the rope essentially pulls on the block right here. And the block, on its, uh, in its own right, also applies a reaction force to the rope which is directed to the left. And it's not shown in this second cartoon. So finally, schematically what happens is force T is applied on the free end of the rope and then force minus T is applied by the block on the other end of the rope. And so those two forces are balanced, the rope is tight, it doesn't break, it doesn't slack. However, for purposes of solving problems, when we indicate the force of tension, we are always going to indicate it like so or like so. We are never going to indicate the reaction force from the block on the rope. Another important consideration is the fact that in most problems that we are going to be doing, if not all of them, we are always going to consider the rope to be massless. So in reality, no rope is massless, but for our purposes, we are going to consider the rope to be massless, which means that the tension is transmitted through the rope without any change from one end to the other. The, the tension doesn't increase or decrease as it's transmitted from the free end to the end that's touched to the uh, load here. Also, if the rope passes over a massless frictionless pulley, the tension is transmitted through the rope without any loss. When we're dealing with the dynamics of motion, there are two main situations to consider. One is when the object under the action of various forces is not accelerating. And so this is known as equilibrium. And the other is when the object under the action of several forces is accelerating, then the object is not in equilibrium. So let's first look at what happens when the object is in equilibrium. Well, when the object, object is in equilibrium, the net force is equal to zero, which means that the components of the net force are also equal to zero. So the x component is equal to zero, and the y component is equal to zero. Therefore, there is no x and y acceleration. 
those are equal to zero. And so this fact here can be used to solve all kinds of problems where objects are in equilibrium. So let's talk about the reasoning strategy when uh, problems involving equilibrium are so being sol solved. So first select an object or objects to which the equations of equilibrium are going to be applied. And so again, as a reminder, that means that the net force in x direction is zero and the net force in y direction is zero. Then draw a free body diagram for each object chosen above, include only forces acting on the object and not forces that the object exerts on its environment. Choose a set of x and y axis for each object and resolve all forces in the free body diagram into components that point along these axes. Apply the equations and solve for the unknown quantities. Let's look at one example of application of the conditions for equilibrium. So consider a car engine that is being held in place by a rope which is being pulled by a person attached to this ring and then another rope that is attached to a pulley like that. Um, the weight of the engine is 3,150 newtons. And the question is, what are these two forces of tension in the rope, T1 and T2, equal to? So the free body diagram for the forces that act on the engine is presented right here. The engine is at the origin of the coordinate system and then the weight of the engine points straight down along the negative y axis. The tension T2 is directed at 80 degrees from the negative y axis. The tension T1 is directed at 10 degrees to the left of the positive y axis. And here we have the breakdown into vector components for the tension T1. So the horizontal component is T1 sine of 10 degrees and the vertical component is T1 cosine of 10 degrees. For the force of tension T2, we have a horizontal component of T2 sine of 80 and vertical component of T2 cosine of 80. So listing the forces and their components in the table looks like so. For force T1, we have negative T1 sine of 10 degrees is the x component. And the minus sign comes from the fact that that component points in negative x direction. The y component is T1 cosine of 10. The, y, uh, the x component of T2 is T2 sine of 80 degrees. And the y component is minus T2 cosine of 80 degrees. The minus sign for the y component is because that component points in negative y direction. And finally, for the weight, it has only one component, and that is minus w because the weight points in negative y direction as well. So then the net force in x direction is the sum of the two x components for the tension forces. So this one is Tx1, uh, and this one is Tx. Two. So we have minus T1 sine of 10 plus T2 sine of 80, and that sum is equal to zero. And then for the y components, we have Ty1 here and Ty2 here. So we have T1 cosine of 10 minus T2 cosine of 80 minus the weight is equal to zero. So from the first equation, I can find an expression for T1 in terms of T2. So that is sine of 80 divided by sine of 10 times T2. Then I can substitute it in the second equation and I get sine of 80 divided by sine of 10 times T2 cosine of 10 minus T2 cosine of 80 minus W is equal to zero. Now this is an equation
for the force of tension T2. And so after rearranging the terms, I get this expression for the force of tension T2. And when I substitute the value for the uh, weight of the engine in here, I get the T2 is 582 newtons. Then I go back to the first expression that relates T1 and T2 right here, substitute T2 in it, and I get the answer for T1, and that is 3.3 .3 times 10 to the third newtons. The second class of problems involving Newton's laws were problems where there is no equilibrium and the object is accelerating. When that is the case, the second law equations change a little bit, and now the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. So the components of the second law become the net force in x direction is equal to the mass times the acceleration in x direction, and the net force in y direction will be equal to mass times acceleration in y direction. Let's look at one example of application of Newton's second laws when an object is moving with acceleration. A super tanker is being pulled by two tugboats, those two. The mass of the tanker is 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilograms. The engines of the tanker are producing force, forward force D, which is 75 times 10 to the third newtons. And the water provides resistance force of 40 times 10 to the third newtons. As a result, the tanker is moving with acceleration of 2 times 10 to the negative 3 meters per second squared. And the question is, what are those two tension forces, T1 and T2, equal to? So the free body diagram of this problem is presented in this uh, drawing here. The tanker is in, at the origin of the coordinate system. And here we have the forces T1, D, T2, and the resistance force from the water. So the forces D and R are along the x-axis, so they do not have a component breakdown. However, the forces T1 and T2 do have a component breakdown. So the breakdown by components for T1 is shown in this window. So T1 has an x component, which is T1 cosine of 30, and a y component, which is T1 sine of 30. And the breakdown by components for the force T2 is shown in this window. So T2 has an x component of T2 cosine of 30 along the x-axis and T2 sine of 30 along the negative y-axis. And so since the tanker is moving in a horizontal direction, there is no vertical acceleration. So Ay is equal to zero. So then that means that the net force component in y direction is equal to zero. So here is the list of forces and their components that are uh, present in the problem. So for T1, the x component is T1 cosine of 30 degrees in positive x direction, and the y component is T1 sine of 30 degrees in positive y direction. For the other tension force, T2, the x component is T2 cosine of 30 in positive x direction, and minus T2 sine of 30 in negative x direction. The force D has only an x component, which is plus D, and force R has only an x component, which is equal to minus R. First, I will apply the second law equation for the net force in y direction. As I stated here, because there is no y acceleration, the net force in y direction is equal to zero. So that means that when I add the two y components of the tension forces, the sum will be equal to zero. And so this one is T1x and this one is T2x. And so the sum is zero. And so that means that the two forces are equal to each other, which is to be expected since the tug bolts are identical and they're pulling at the same angle from the horizontal. For the x component of the net force, I have the sum of the x component of T1, the x component of T2, and then D 
and R. And when you add all of these four forces together, that will be equal to the mass times the acceleration of the super tanker in X direction. Renaming the two tension forces, T1 and T2, to just T, then I can solve for T by rearranging the terms in this equation. And so T is equal to MAX plus R minus D divided by two times cosine of 30. Substituting all the values in this relationship gives me that the tension in the ropes or cables is 1.53 times 10 to the fifth newtons. Now I want to just conceptually explain a particular situation of an object on a surface. So here we have an inclined plane and I have a block that is placed on that inclined plane. And so I want to show all the forces that act on this block. Um, to encompass a bigger set of possible problems, let's add to that a little bit. So the inclined plane ends like so, and this block is connected with a cable to, through a pulley to a block that is hanging here from the cable. So the first block will have mass M1. There's gonna be block number one. There's block number two. So block number one has a mass M1 and block number two has mass M2. So now let's do a free body diagram for the forces that act on each block. So first of all, for block number one, the force, the weight of the block is pointing straight down. Let's call it W1. And there is a normal force due to the contact with that flat surface, and this normal force is perpendicular to the surface, like in that direction. So the normal force will be like so. Normal force. And for now, let's assume that there is no friction, but because of this hanging block here, which applies tension to the rope, tension right here, there will be also tension in the rope applied to block number one, like that. And the two tension forces are going to be equal because this rope does not stretch, it's uniform, and so on and so forth. Now, according to the rules of how we solve the problems, well, what I also need to do is I need to introduce coordinate system, a coordinate system for each of the two bodies in order to um, be able to dissolve the forces uh, into components. So for block number one, my coordinate system, I choose to have vertically up uh, to be the positive uh, vertical axis, positive y. And also I want to have my positive x-axis parallel to the incline, pointing like so. So when I do that, then the weight has two components. It has... W, one, Y. So it has a Y component and it has a, an X component. What now I need to also determine is what is the angle, let's say, between the Y component and the, of the weight and the weight. This is actually pretty straightforward. So this small triangle here that is formed by the weight the y component and the x component, so this side here, is similar to the triangle that is formed by the inclined plane. So notice the hypotenuse of this small triangle, that's the weight. Uh, if I flip it and uh, put it on top of the large triangle formed by the inclined plane, the hypotenuse, which is the weight here, will match with the incline itself. 
the weight, the y component of the weight will match with the base of this triangle, and then the x component of the weight will match with the height. And so therefore, from the symmetry, uh, from the similarity, this angle here will be theta as well. So then I can write the components of the weight in terms of the angle. So W1x is equal to W1 sine of theta and W2, uh, W1y W1y is equal to W1 cosine of theta. So right now this exhausts all the forces that act on block number one. So for block number two, I already discussed the tension force, but there is one more force that acts on it, and that's the weight W2, which is straight down. So now I can write Newton's second law equations for each block individually. So for block number one, the net force in x direction will be equal to the tension T minus W1x, which will be equal to the tension T minus W1 sine of theta. And in general, this will be equal to M1 times AX. So in x direction right here, the net force is the difference between the tension force and the x component of the weight. And if the block is accelerating, then that's going to be equal to the mass of the blocks times, times the acceleration in the x direction. If the block is moving with constant velocity, then this side here will be equal to zero. It just depends on how the problem is set up. Now let's do the y component of the net force for that block. So the y component is simply equal to Fn minus W1y, which is Fn minus W1 cosine of theta. And because there is no acceleration in, a vert in the vertical along the y-axis, uh, this sum is equal to zero. And so from here, I can say that the normal force is just equal to W1 cosine of theta. So right now for this problem, this is not an actually important piece of information. However, in the cases when there is friction between the block and the incline, the force of friction was proportional to the normal force. So therefore, from the Y coordinate of the second law of the net force, you will find an expression for the normal force in terms of the weight and substitute it in the x component where the friction is going to be present. All right, so this exhausts the options for uh, block number one for the x and y components of the second law. Now let's do block number two. So for block number two, there is no horizontal motion, so the net force in x direction is zero. And the net force in y direction is just the tension minus the weight of the block. And so if there is acceleration during that motion, then that will be mass times the acceleration in y direction. Here I've chosen the y, dire y direction to be vertically up. Um, so if, of course, there is no acceleration, then this right side will be equal to zero. And so these four equations here completely describe that system of two blocks as it's moving in regards to this inclined plane. Now notice something important. The weight here has two components, y and x component, and the y component of the weight balances the normal force, or the normal force balances the y component of the weight. So it's no longer the normal force balances the weight itself, and that is because of this angle here that the incline makes with the horizontal.